everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining and thank you for that introduction and more generally for uh, the uh, LAVA committee for creating this incredible uh, free Yom Neroim and actually I think running all the way through to, to Sukkot's uh, program. Um, it's it's very exciting and uh, very inspiring to see the, the lineup that's uh, been put in place and uh, it's a wonderful thing to to have uh, everyone gathered here to try and learn and prepare better for Rosh Hashanah and uh, Yom Kippur and uh, Yimei Adin and then obviously followed by Yom Tov. So, so thank you for that and uh, Chazak, Chazak, Mitz Hashem, uh, uh, we should all continue to be able to learn Torah and uh, uh, together. So um, I wanted to look at the Rambam in Hilchus Shiva. Um For those of you who uh, attended or have attended my Shirim for several years and have very good memories, um, you will know that we've looked at this Rambam before. The truth is, almost every year I find myself ending up looking back at this Rambam. Um, but even though it's the same Rambam, hopefully each time there's a different uh, insight and thought that uh, we can share with this. So these are not new sources. They're ones that we've uh, we've really uh, looked at in previous occasions, but nonetheless uh, deserve re-looking at again. Um, it's a familiar and well-known thing that we we struggle all of us struggle, um, at least I do, and I suspect many others also, struggle to to, to, to shiver. Um, I, it's, it's almost, a, you know, a well-known uh, joke, New Year's resolutions, and they don't really stick that well. And um, and it's hard to change. It's, it's genuinely hard to change, to really change. Now, I, I don't want to overemphasize that. Uh, hopefully we can all look at our lives and we can see some areas in which we've improved, and some commitments, maybe we can look back on previous Rosh Hashanahs and see that we've uh, we've grown a little bit. But I, again, just speaking for, my, for myself, and I think for lots of others also, we certainly feel a little bit of frustration or, or disappointment. There's so many things that we uh, we know we need to change in and, and don't often don't really do. Sometimes we can feel almost yearish, almost despair or helplessness, um, an inability to change, uh, an inability to make change stick. Uh, resolutions that come and go, and and that's that's difficult and that's frustrating. So, a lot of times, uh, this is very discussed. I'm not the first one to speak about this, but probably every pre Rosh Hashanah speaker discusses these ideas and these problems, and uh, um, everyone says their own insights. But the truth is, the Rambam amazingly did this work for us, and the Rambam collated 24 uh, qualities or elements which hindered the Shabbat. So this is not a new problem. Uh, the Rambam a thousand years ago was dealing with this. And the truth is the Rambam really uh, collated those 24 things from various Gemaras and Medrashim and Mishnayos and other sources that are scattered around in, in the thinking of Chazal. So really these sources date back thousands of years. They're part of Torah Shabbat Peh. And the Rambam, like so many other areas, he sort of drew out um, concepts from the various ideas of Chazal and put them all together in the amazing and remarkable and brilliant way that the Rambam does. But the Rambam actually gave us the hard work. And I've never really, to my embarrassment, never really sat and actually thought, you know what, so if we're dealing with this problem, and again, I, I think we all to some degree deal with this, that we struggle with the Shubha, it doesn't make sense. Why have we never, I, I shouldn't say myself, I'm, I've never really learned these 24 things, but Ian, because the Rambam lists them as the 24 factors that make it hard to do to Shubha, so surely it makes sense to, uh, to, to do. So what I really want to do today, depending subject to time and how far we get, is to try and... Um, look through these 24 things. I want to start by just learning the Ramam's introduction to Teshuva, where he explains what Teshuva is, and then uh, look at his list of 24 things and, and see uh, what we can understand of those, and then maybe if there's a bit of time, sort of revisit and reconnect that back to Teshuva, but may maybe we won't get to the third element uh, this year, and maybe we'll do that another year. So, so what is uh, Teshuva? So Again, and, and I, I think I, every year, probably when I speak in this slot, I, I say the same thing, but I, I, I think it bears repeating every single year. Um, we get lost in, we lose sight of the wood from the trees sometimes. And, and you know, if you say to someone, what's the shiva? They'll often say, well, it's got um, vidoy and davening and harata about the past, regret about the past and acceptance for the future and all these other elements, which are all absolutely true. But the essence of the shiva is, is change. I used to do that era, and now I no longer do that era. That, that's what Teshuvah is. Everything else is, is important and linked and uh, um, enhances and, and is an obligation even to do. But the essence of Teshuvah is simply, I was doing something wrong, and now I'm no longer doing that wrong thing. That, that is what Teshuvah is, plain and simple. 
And in essence, to shove is a very simple and quick thing to do. It, it's hard because it takes us a long time to get there. But in principle, it's, it's just a switch. It's I was doing this wrong thing and now I'm no longer doing uh, this, this wrong thing. And by the way, to shove can also be, in its most basic level, quite superficial. So it obviously ideal to shove is where I make a proper internal change to ensure that I don't do something wrong. But but to shove can be external as, as long as it will ensure that I don't slip up, that's also good enough. That's also to shove because I'm ceasing to sin. So it's only the highest level of to shove, but it is basic to shove. So for example, if I know that when I'm in a certain environment, I always slip up and mess up. And I make a commitment, which I keep, a real commitment not to get into that environment. I know there's a certain social circle, a hangout area, or, or, or which, which draws me into, into behavior that lessens my standards, or just someone who winds me up and drives me crazy, and I always end up rowing with them in a horrible way. So the real to shove is, of course, to work on my middles, so that I don't row with this person, or that I don't get drawn into this inappropriate behavior when I'm hanging out in this scene, or, or, or the like. But that's a very hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. To shove it as if I'm sure that I don't, this doesn't happen, that I don't slip up. So it can be something superficial. That I just make sure I don't get into this environment or I don't mix with this person. And as long as I've put in place whatever it is that will ensure that I don't slip up, I no longer sin, that is called to shove. So I know in shul I always end up talking in Dublin because I sit next to my best friend. Wonderful. Keep the best friend, absolutely. But, it, but it's to shove even just to sit somewhere else in shul. So I'm not sitting next to my best friend and then I won't talk in Dublin. The real deep to shava is to change my relationship to tefillah, so I'm no longer talking even when I'm tempted to talk. But the basic level of to shava is, as long as I'm not I'm going to stop doing that, then that's great. So I've shifted my moment. You know, there's someone I, I, I love nattering to and, and gossiping to and sharing all the latest news and so on. The real to shava is to shift how I, I deal with, with, with Lashon Hara. But the, the more basic thing is, if I can avoid that conversation, then at least I've, I've dealt with it. So to shava can be very profound, a real change of, of personality, and it can just be sufficient that I put something in place that, that will stop me um slipping up in this way and that's that's also uh that's also an achievement that's also uh that's that's also enough um i'm struggling with davening i'm finding myself not davening every day and so on now, now that should be properly changed and the real to shove is a change of relationship so i do start uh davening properly and that that's fantastic but let's remind ourselves that the core um, obligation of to mm -hmm. is just to speak to hashem even momentarily for one moment so I know that I'm always uh, commuting to uni at a certain time of day, and I'm likely to be on, on the northern line, always uh, you know, at 11 o'clock, or I know that I always uh, log into Zoom at uh, 1 o'clock, whatever it is, or I'm always going to be on my computer every day. So I just put a little note on my computer um, with a text of one bracha. Okay, so is that great to fill up? No, it's not. Is that a real internal change of personality? Not so much. But is that to shiver? Because I, it means I will say words of tefillah every single day. Yeah. So that, that's to shiver. So to shiver, it's nice when to shiver is profound, but let's not lose sight of the basic thing, which is I used to do something wrong. I'm now not doing that something wrong. Or there was something right I ought to have done, which I wasn't doing. Now I do that. That is the, the essence of to shiver. So with all the ink spilt about the details of shiver, let's not forget the basic to shiver, which is simply... I was doing something wrong, and I'm now no longer doing it wrong. Or there's something right, I, something I should have done, and I wasn't doing it, and now I'm doing this. That's the essence of Shiva. I think I've shared before, but again, I'll, I'll just remind you of this. An amazing Gemara in Kedushin. And uh, Gemara in Kedushin discusses, um, is discussing the laws of, of Kedushin, of marriage. And it discusses conditional marriage. So I'm not comment, commenting on the rights and wrongs of entering into a, a relationship where instead of saying, hurry up, Kedushin, someone says, hurry up, Kedushin, on condition. But, but it's discussing the legalities of that. And the Gemara discusses a story of a uh, a lady who is about to get married to her husband to be, and she hears rumors that he's not such a good fellow. That he sounds like he's a Russia, and he uh, he says, "I'm not. I'm 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 I'm, not, I'm a great bad fellow. Like you know, what, what, what's this about?" And she says, I'm, I, "I've heard too much. I, I don't." He says, "Look, let's make a conditional marriage. Hurry up to Mukadashetli. You are." sanctified to me, you are transcendent to me, you are Mukadashet, we are we are married. Um Almanat on condition Shani Sadik Gamal, that's a perfectly righteous person. An amazing condition to make in the marriage. Wow. Okay. They are married and she finds out that five minutes before the Khopa he was doing the most terrible things. So can she be sure that this Almanat, this conditional marriage is ineffective? And the one says no, she can't be sure. Because in theory, in principle, Tashuba can take a second. Shemar 
here we have a libo. Maybe he thought in his heart at that moment to shiva. So maybe the 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 love he felt for his wife to be, the inspiration he felt standing under his chuppah, maybe at that moment there was genuine teshuvah. So teshuvah can take a second. In theory, the essence of teshuvah is, is ceasing to, to, to sin, ceasing to what you're doing. And that in principle, it's, it's, it's a very quick thing. So we have this paradox that on the one hand, the essence of teshuvah is very simple. And on the other hand, it's, it's very, very hard to do most of the time. And that's what we're going to learn. So what are the things that hold up teshuvah? Why is it so hard to do? Um, but before we do that, let's learn a piece of Rambam together, and the Rambam defines what uh, Teshuvah is. Rose, by the way, how long do I have for the Shia? How long is the Shia for? It's so already about an hour. Okay, great. Okay. Kol Mitzvah, let's learn the Rambam together. Um, Perek Aleph of Hilch Teshuvah, Halach Aleph, right? This is a good place to start. Chapter 1, Halach one of the Laws of Teshuvah. Kol HaMitzvah Shabbat Torah, all Mitzvahs in the Torah. Bein Asei, Bein Lois Asei, whether they're negative or positive. In other Odom al Achat Mehem, if someone transgressed one of them, Beim Zodin, Beim Mishkoga, whether deliberately or by mistake, Keshiyasa to Shuva, the Yosh of Mecheto, Chag Disvatis Lithnia Kalborofu. When they do to Shuva and uh, return from their sin, they have to confess in front of God. And he cites a Pasuk that Vidoi is a mitzvah sase. Okay, so we've discussed this in previous years, so I'm not going to go through this again. Um, but this Rambam has two parts to it. The first part of the Rambam is, he says, when you do Teshuvah. And the second part is, then there is an obligation to say Vidoy. Very, very interesting. Vidoy is not part of Teshuvah. It's when you do Teshuvah, then you have to confess in front of Hashem. The essence of Teshuvah doesn't demand Vidoy. We saw that, by the way, in many sources, including in this Gemara that we learned about the, the marriage uh, proposal on, on, on tonight, that Shuva can be done. Where does Shuva take place? Not in our mouths, in our minds. Here, I believe, thought. Shuva is a change of mind. The effect has to be a change of action, but the Shuva is, is in thought. So to Shuva is not Vidoy. When we're standing in Shul in Slichas tomorrow morning, Ashamnu, Baganu, Gazalnu, on Yom Kippur, right to our made Shuva, Al Khait, etc., that's not to Shuva. To Shuva is the change. Vidoy is a mitzvah triggered by the change. It's a bit analogous, by the way, to any other conditional mitzvah or circumstantial mitzvah. So there's no mitzvah to go around benching the whole time. If you eat a bread meal, you have to say, Bechat HaMazun. If you have a house with a door, you have to put some mezuzah up. If you don't have a house with a door, so you don't put some mezuzah up. If you have a flat roof, you have to build a fence, a marker. So Tshuva is almost that vidoy. I mean, the Raman's model, very interesting. It's, it's a bit similar to that. If you do Tshuva, then you have to say vidoy. Very interesting uh, model. Why do Raman select this model? We're not going to discuss this year. Um, I don't know if we've got recordings on YouTube from previous years. If not, I'll do it in a future year. Um, very interesting. But that's the Rambam's view of what Tshuva, uh, what, what tshuva is. Um, question. What's the point then of vidoy? If vidoy is not Tshuva, what's the point of vidoy? What's the point of confessing? Why, why, why do vidoy if 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 it's if you've done the already? Yes. Makes much more real and tangible. But 100% very nice. Yeah. One reason for vidoy is it makes more concrete, more real. Right. Things that are just left in thought are, are a bit unreal. But it's saying when you do the shava, concretize it, verbalize it. Okay, what else can we say about uh, about shava? About vidoy. I'm sorry. Very, very nice answer. Vidoy is always in Hashem. It's always in front of Hashem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, you, you need to confess in front of Hashem, so it's about relationship. Yeah. W why particularly are we concerned about relationship here? Why, why here are we focusing on a relationship with Hashem? It, it, correct. In other words, even though the essence of Teshuvah is ceasing to sin, but there's also relationship damage that happens. So it, it's it's returning to that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so about this book, that Shiva is changing the way the doing is It's somewhat, yeah, it's somewhat like that. Yeah. Um, if Teshuva looks forward, Vidoy looks backwards. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Vidoy is not to shove itself, according to the Rambam's model, um, but it definitely concretizes the shove, it makes it more permanent, and it rebuilds, you, you said builds relationship, all I'm adding to your answer is rebuilds relationship, right? It's repairing the relationship that's been damaged, but what you said is absolutely right, yes. Yeah. Can Teshuvah therefore kind of be confused with that guilt feeling you get after doing 
you, you feel bad about what you've done. Oh, I must change this, but that's your skill. You know? Okay, so it's a very, very good question. And when I was preparing the shit, I was thinking of speaking about this and decided not to then. But, but since giving me the opportunity, I'll, I'll speak about it very briefly. Uh, do you remember I said, if I, if I have time at the end of the shit, I'll come back to try tying things together. So I was going to focus on that point. But very briefly, it, it's a longer topic. Shuv is actually quite a complicated thing, even though I said it's in essence very simple, but when you, when you unpick it, it becomes very complicated. Um, however, the essence of the shuva is not guilt, feeling guilty. Um, vidoy, looking back, involves guilt. The essence of the shuva is looking forward. Now, again, I, I'm only saying this half seriously, but, but I am saying it half seriously. If someone does something wrong and they say, oh, that's so kashmak, that was really fun. But I recognize it was wrong and I'm never going to do it again. That is to shuva. To shuva is not doing something again. Is that a great to shove? <laughs> it's very feeble to shove. But we spoke about feeble to shove, and, and feeble to shove are also good. They're, they're, they're also good, right? We spoke about the person who hasn't really changed their relationship to Lashon Hara, or to davening, or to doing inappropriate things, or to getting angry. They haven't done that internal change. One of the reasons I wanted to give this year was because we spent a lot of time talking about high level to shove, and that's great. But I want to talk about low level to shove also, because we also need to recognize that something we speak about changing our, our mid art and all that. And, and then at the same time, we say take on little things. But there's some there's a bit missing between the two halves of it, which is even superficial changes is worthwhile because at least I'm no longer doing it. So to shove in the Ramam's thinking is forward looking. As long as I'm not going to go back to it, even though I didn't feel any sense of shame or regret, that is to By the way, you can have the opposite thing. You can feel a deep sense of shame and regret and not do to shove I think we all experience this, sadly. Maybe I'm, I'm revealing my own flaws and weaknesses here, but I think this applies to lots of people. You, you, one can be very conscious that I've messed up and then do it again and again and again and again. And actually, ironically, the shame and the guilt can just make you feel worse, but not actually do anything positive about it. So sometimes, by the way, shame and guilt can make someone uh, um, mess up. I'll, I'll tell you, actually, I'll, I'll share a, a personal story with you. Um, there's someone, uh, not a member of this community, but a member of the wider community who uh, I'm very close to, and... About three weeks ago, I realized I'd let them down badly in a certain area. And I, I was really profoundly embarrassed and shameful about that. Um, I was so ashamed. I hadn't, I hadn't helped them in a certain rabbinical way that I should have. And I hadn't got back to them about it and in, in quite a sensitive area. And, and I, I was really, really profoundly shameful about this. Um, now it gets to the awful part because I didn't do anything about it. I was so embarrassed and ashamed that um, for about two weeks, I did nothing because I couldn't face it. So the shame was paralyzing. Now, I, I don't think I'm not a terrible, horrible person. I don't think anything awful here, but I, there was something I should have done to someone they'd asked me to do. I, it was a quite sensitive and important matter and I hadn't got back to them. I'd let it slip and it was a time of year. But that's okay, that happens sometimes. But the shocking thing is, I then didn't do anything longer because I, I didn't know how to handle it because I found the whole thing a bit overwhelming. I was so embarrassed. Um, okay, it gets more than that because it's really interesting. The person came up to me and said to me, can I ask you something straight out? Are you upset with me? So I said, why? Why should I be upset with you? So because I noticed when you're with me, you're feeling a bit, you're a bit stiff and awkward and you're sort of avoiding me. I said, you know what? It's time for me to grow up, actually. You're right, because I'm feeling awkward, awkward because I've, I messed up about this and I apologise. And I'm so grateful to this person, actually, that he more cuts than I did and he actually approached me. And now, okay, why am I telling you the story other than public confession? It makes me feel a bit better. Um, <laughs> because it's not uncommon that when we mess up somehow we, and we feel deep shame, actually, it, it, we, it, it doesn't affect how we behave. We, either we just carry on because even though we regret it, but we also like it enough that we carry on doing it, or actually it means, leaves us feeling low and therefore reduced energy. Feeling low doesn't really give you the energy often to do to shove up. Um, or sometimes we feel so bad that it actually stops us doing the, the thing because I felt so awkward with this person that I didn't call them because the more awkward I felt, the more the, the harder I found them to call them. Okay, so shame and regret are have a place, but they are stage two. Stage one is ceasing to do this bad thing. Don't sit there wallowing in the regret and pain. And I, I use the word wallowing not in a critical way, because sometimes it's in the I don't mean one's choosing to do so. But don't let yourself get immersed in that pain and regret and end up not being sure. I, I want to tell you, when you're looking at changing, don't look back, look forward. That's stage one. There is a stage two of looking back. We'll see in a few moments the language of Vidoy, regret and shame that has a place. But that's stage two. Stage one is look forward. By the way, this is always the secret in life. When you're going through a tough time in, in life, don't ask yourself, why is this happening? What's God punishing for me? Trying, you know, speculate. Look forward and say, what can I draw positive out of it? 
Stage two, I can then think, okay, what lessons can I learn going back? But that that is is something to be done from points of health, from points of healing, from points of teshuva, from points of well-being. That that's an important thing to do. I'm not, not denying that. Of course, it's important. The Raman says when you do teshuva, you should do vizoy. But stage one is 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 the forward-looking teshuva. In this understanding, is is, is forward-looking. It's about I was doing something wrong. How can I stop doing it, it wrong? It's, it, it's simple in its core. However, when you do teshuva, then there is a mitzvah to do vidoy, and vidoy includes everything we've spoken about: rebuilding relationships, concretizing and verbalizing, and regret and uh, and shame. Okay, let's have a look at the continuation of the Ramam now, based on that. Um, so the Ramam says, "Kate Sad Miss Vada, how does one confess?" Is everyone with me? Source one, um, paragraph two in source one. How does one confess? And the answer is, "Omer." The person says, "Honor Hashem," meaning the word "Honor Hashem." Honor Hashem, honor Hashem. Please, O oh God. When the English translator doesn't implore you, w- w- why please God? Well, let's carry on and see what it says. Chatosi, I've sinned. Evisi, I've transgressed. Pashati, I, I, I uh, was negligent. Fanech, in front of you. Vasiti, kacha, kacha, I did X, Y, Z. Vari, nechamti, ovoshti, bemasoi. I am, uh, we'll translate these words a bit better in a minute, but for now I'll just translate them. I regret and I'm embarrassed about my deeds. Il olam eini. Um, and I will never go back to this thing. And then the Ram says, Vidoy, this is the essential elements of Vidoy. One who profusely elaborates on these matters that's worthy of praise. Okay, so the essence of Vidoy is a fairly short formula. Um, elaborating video is a nice thing to do, but it's not the essence of, uh, it's praiseworthy, it's a good thing to do, but it's not the essence of Vidoy. So let's unpick the critical elements of Vidoy. Honor Hashem, please Hashem. Why, why please, Hashem? Why are you saying please to God? What are you asking for? When you say please, you're asking for something. What's the please that you're saying to Hashem? Yeah. Mercy, mercy for what? For what? For what we've done. Why do you need mercy? You don't what? Mercy. Why? But why? What do you need mercy from? What will happen if you don't get mercy? It's very interesting. The Raman doesn't say words about punishment here. Nothing to do with punishment. It doesn't say punishment. You do daven later. We do daven a lot on Rosh Hashanah, but not to get punished. That's not in the in the Vidoy prayer. Yeah. It it hundred percent does. But what are we not entitled to? What comes before punishment? You, you said the words. Sorry. Accepting the teshuva, forgiveness, right? It, it, you're right, non-forgiveness leads into punishment, but this isn't about punishment, that's something else. It's forgiveness. Or to get back to your language, it's relationship building, right? It's all re- rebuilding relationship, 100%. So the honor Hashem is for the gift of forgiveness, the gift of rebuilding a relationship. Uh, we are, of course we care about punishment, but it's not just about punishment. By the way, you can offend someone and they'll never punish you. Maybe there's situations which I'm no intention of punishing, but we still want to do teshuva because we want to do teshuva because we 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 want we can't take it for granted. Not that we can't. You're right that we also don't want to be punished, and there are other tefillahs where we'd rather not to be punished. But the essence of vidoy is, please, Hashem, I've sinned. I, I want to, um, I, I want I want you, you to be pleased with me again. I want us to have our relationship again. That's the essence of vidoy. More than that, and we'll see this in the Ramam later. Essential to teshuva is recognition that we need Hashem's help even to not sin again. And this is a deeper reason of the vidoy. We say, honor Hashem, please Hashem, I've sinned and I'm not going to go back to it. Part of what we're doing in vidoy is we're davening to Hashem, not just for forgiveness and not just for relationship rebuilding, but for teshuva to be able to change. What does that mean? That means that when you've sinned, we've slightly dulled or lessened our sensitivity. This is a very spiritual thing in, in our relationship to Hashem. We've, we've damaged our ruchnias, our nashamas, that's all true. But it's also a very practical thing, right? If you're horrible to someone, you slightly dull, dull your sensitivity to their feelings. So you've, you've, it, it's a chidush. It's, it's innovative. It's news. It's not obvious. It's not something to take for granted that teshuv is possible, that change is possible. Change is possible. We humans are, are infinitely plastic. We can change. But that's not something to take for granted. That's a unique gift from Hashem, from our Tzalem and Ochim, from our godliness within us, from the gift of Bechira and free will that we have, that we can change. Who said that we can change? Right? A car that's engine has been damaged 
can't do to shiva and rebuild its ability to speed. A, a singer that's overstrained their voice and damaged their vocal cords may not be able to rebuild their, their vocal cords to be able to become a, a good singer again. Things happen in life where you damage and rupture, and, and who says you can rebuild them? Maybe, maybe there's a scar tissue that's built up and the desensitivity that's gone. So we're done into Hashem, honor Hashem, please Hashem, because I'm recognizing that, I'm, that there's a gift into shiva. By the way, we, we, we sort of govern for that in, um, in Tzfilah. If you look in the, in the Shemona Esra, the regular Shemona Esra that we daven, we daven Slach Lono Avinu Kichotanu Mechalonu, please forgive us, but we also daven to Hashem um, to bring us back to Torah, Shevein Avinu, bring us back. That means to shuva, returns Hashem is something also to daven for. We daven for forgiveness, really important, of course we want Hashem to forgive us, but we also want Hashem to literally bring us back, to help us get back, because it's not obvious that we'll be able to return. Right? I, I use the analogy, imagine a, a dead end street that's also one way. Let's see him try down it. It's dead end streets. You can't get out the other end and you can't go the other direction. Because the one way street. There are situations in life that can feel like when we're feeling stuck that we've gone down a one way dead end street. But that's not true. We have Salam and Kim. We, we, we believe in our God's work. We have the Kira. There's that which is godly within us. That's, but that's a gift. That's something that we need to ask for. It's not something that we can take uh, for granted. Okay. So we've already got, in a sense, the first clue to growing into Shiva. Just oven for it, like everything else in life. Why am I saying all of this? Because sometimes we can miss this over a Shashkun Kippah. We can daven for forgiveness. Great. Nothing wrong with that at all. Slicha Mechira. Kapara. We can daven for mercy. Hashem shouldn't punish us. Hashem, Hashem, Kalach, and Mechanon, all wonderful. Absolutely right that we shouldn't be punished. Avinu Malkeinu, right? Kralonu, you know, Gazazanenu, tear up the evil decree. All important. But there's something else we should daven for. Please, Hashem, help us change. That's something to daven for. On Hashem, the essence of Vidoy is a, a pleading to Hashem. Rebuild the connection, rebuild the relationship. Help me get back to you. I want to re restore the connection that we had. That's uh, part of Vidoy. Okay, so that's one element of uh, Vidoy. On Hashem. I'm not going to this year go into the difference between Chatosi, Ovisi, and Pashati, the three languages used for sin. Um, if you look in a good machza, it explains the differences between these terminology, there's different views, but we all know there's many elements to sin. Sometimes sin happens because of carelessness, sometimes it, it, it happens deliberately because I gave into temptation, sometimes it happens from a point of view of rebellion, there's all these layers to sin. The Ramam already, by the way, in the first paragraph, the Ramam alluded to that. It said you have to do to shove on bad things that you did that you shouldn't have done. And good things that you didn't do. So that's already two elements. Then he says, maze it and show you gates, deliberate and by mistake. So there's lots of layers of sin, and, and we're not going to go into that uh, for the purposes of our discussion today. But you say khatasi, avisi, pashati. I I I I made all these three types of mistakes. Who did how and in what way did I do these mistakes? Lufanecha in front of you. So this again gets us back to that word used relationship. In other words, I was in front of you. Maybe what happened was when I sinned, I forgot that I was in front of you. So another element or aspect of Vidoy is I'm standing in front of Hashem to make up for my non-awareness of standing in front of Hashem before. When, when I sin, besides the Avera itself I've done, or the non-mitzvah that I didn't do, I've also forgotten that I'm the that I'm, I'm in front of you, Hashem. So in the process of Vidoy, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reminding myself in front of you. Then we say, and this is what you mentioned, I regret I'm, and I'm embarrassed for my deeds. So certainly in Vidoy, one has to move beyond that. Oh, that, was, that was really good, but I won't do it again. Two, actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I realize this was wrong. I realize I let myself uh, down. This wasn't the right way to behave. Okay. Is. Um, is shame and embarrassment a good mid or a bad mid? Is it a good thing to experience or a bad thing to experience? Is it healthy or unhealthy? Yeah. Certainly. And I spoke before about how sometimes shame and embarrassment can be crippling. Can be it can it can make one unable to act. Absolutely. What else can we say about shame and embarrassment? So I think there's two points. The first is, as I mentioned, shame and embarrassment should come after you've made the change. When you do Teshuvah, then have the shame and embarrassment so that you, it doesn't uh, hold you back. Once you've made Teshuvah and you've repaired things and you're better, now have shame and embarrassment. Why, why do you sh now should you have shame and embarrassment? Yeah. It keeps you away from the sin. It keeps you away from the sin, 100%. Once you've moved away from it, it's a positive sensation. When you're in it, as I said, it can be draining. 
And it's not, it's certainly not to sugar. You can feel shame. And even if it's not as extreme as my case, where the shame sort of paralyzed me, but even in a moderate level, so you can feel shame and still carry on doing things. We're all like that the whole time. But once you've done sugar, it keeps you away from it. Um, number two, it's honest. It's true. If you've understood what you've done is wrong, there should be shame. It's not a negative uh, emotion. It's an honest uh, um, reflection of things. It's, it's accurate. Um, interestingly, the Ramam says, the Ramam adds in, I'm ashamed about my deeds. He doesn't say you should be ashamed about who and what you are. Shame about yourself as, as what and who you are is it, actually a complicated thing, whether that's a good or bad thing. But that's not what the Ramam says in Vidoy. And there may be times where you can look back and say, I, I was a different sort of person or whatever. But that's not what we're talking about in Vidoy. Don't think that's what Vidoy means. Vidoy means my actions let me down. My actions I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed of. My actions weren't me at my best. Embarrassment means I recognize this wasn't me. And, and this gets to, someone mentioned this before. Someone mentioned that Teshuvah is, 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 isn't just returning to Hashem. Oh, I don't know if it was mentioned. Teshuvah is not just returning to Hashem. It's also returning to myself, right? Being the person I can. And again, uh, that, that's a, a lengthier discussion. But the point of embarrassment is you're not embarrassed about something that was you and was right to be you, right? Um, if, if, if you, uh, I don't know, allowed yourself to lie down the whole day and let people just do everything for you and didn't bother making any effort and to look after yourself in, in the most basic way or to help, you might be embarrassed about that. But news for all of you, we all spent several years of our life doing that when we were babies and we're not embarrassed about that in the least. Because we weren't letting ourselves down, because that was what was appropriate for us. It, embarrassment is when when we're not done is inappropriate to me. So it, the the second stage of shuvah, not the first stage of shuvah, the second stage of shuvah is now that I realise it was inappropriate to me. So I'm, I'm embarrassed. Embarrassment is a positive emotion in that sense because I'm I'm saying it wasn't the real me. It wasn't what I could have been and should have been up to. The first stage, it, it, embarrassment. It, the reason embarrassment is an important emotion is because to shuvah ultimately comes with embarrassment because you don't do to shiver for being a baby <laughs> you don't do to shiver uh mum you know i'm really sorry i didn't do the washing up for the first five years of my life or three years of my life it, it wasn't there's nothing embarrassing about that it's not that's not a to shiver scenario this by the way is also the reason why embarrassment should only and shame should really only come after you've changed it's, it's not that we can't feel ashamed beforehand but it's not particularly useful it's not particularly relevant it's somewhat to, it's almost fooling ourselves that we like i'm feeling ashamed so that means i'm a good person that's in a way that's almost comforting change commit to the future in a real way then now that is no longer the real me i can feel i can feel uh shame and embarrassment about it so that's also what part of what the ramam says in my deeds um this is a little off subject but i i, I want to stress why um one side implication of all of this which is everyone here in this room has their own journey and their own experiences and so on um, some of you in this room may be big governors, some of you small governors, some of you may be grappling with a lot going on in your life, and some of you may not have that much going on, some may be going through difficult patches, some may be going through easy patches. Sometimes you and Kippa can feel like a very negative and weighty and heavy day. And, and it, it is in a way weighty and heavy. There is a, of course there is, that's what Yom Kippur is about, somewhat. But Yom Kippur is also a liberating day, right? It was, it was described by Chazal as the happiest day in the year. Um, everyone has to think in combination with, with care. Um, it, 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 what part of my avodah of Yom Kippur is, is right and appropriate that I do? And if I find it a bit tough, that's just because I need to put more effort in and I'm being a bit lazy. And what part of my work in Yom Kippur actually is going to draw me into a place that I can't handle and that's not right for me and not help, healthy for me? And it's important to know that the essence of Teshuvah takes a second, as per our story of the Chuppah scene, where it tells the condition of the second. And the essence of Shiva is a vidoy. You don't have to do 10-bit vidoys. One should. It's built into the structure of the day that we do 10 vidoys over Yom Kippur, right? Because we do in each of the five fillers with the Chazar Sashats, and there we go. We do 10 vidoys over the Holy Yom Kippur. That, that, and the vidoys are really lengthy. al will and it goes on and on, and the and so on. This is the Takonas Chazal, how they structure that we should do vidoy. But that's not it crucial vidoy. That's not the essence of vidoy. The essence of vidoy is, is a fairly brief thing. Um, someone uh, contacted me the other day and said that they um, accidentally ended up uh, a very sincere, good, uh, from person. It was a complicated event, was in someone's house, and they ended up having um, food of, of very arguable kashras, a terrible experience to go through for, for someone who cares about kashras, and they were in a lot of pain about it. Um, I, I said to this person, which I think is the right advice for this particular individual, I'm not saying it's right for everyone, um, I said, to them, you're right, okay, something, something bad happened. How long does it take you to do Shashuvah? 
It takes a second. You might regret that you are regretting it. It's not going to happen again because they learned a lesson from it. They wrote in their question and they wrote to me. They said, I know now I need to check uh, the labels more carefully. Okay, so they've, they've done a couple off in the future. Now what do they need to do? About 10 seconds work. I'm sorry I ate the non kosher food. I, I, I was negligent in front of you. Please, Hashem. Finished. And, and sometimes for someone, the correct advice to say is, it's also for you, it's forbidden for you to go back and say any more videos about that. So, sometimes it is appropriate to carry on saying more videos, but sometimes that, 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 that will stress someone in, in such a profoundly unhealthy way. I, I want you to know, we're meant to be mamilim, we're meant to believe in Hashem. Part of belief in Hashem is belief in Teshuvah. The Torah teaches us, we believe in Torah. Torah teaches us as a concept of Teshuvah. So trust in Hashem. That he, he, he allows you to do Teshuvah. So you've done Teshuvah. So finish, then move on. We don't have to double guess Hashem. Now you'll tell me, so why are there many videos? And there's Madrigas and all these things. Of course there are, and there's ele elevated things. But if the Madrig is driven by a positive emotion, I want to draw closer to Hashem, I want to grow more, great, say another video. If it's driven by guilt and, and uh, a feeling of, I haven't done enough, don't say another video, because it's just going to be negative. It's just dragging one down. It's it's just, it's drawing on away from Hashem. Have a mono in Hashem. Hashem said to do Teshuvah. Teshuvah takes, in this case, if this particular person, they had done Teshuvah, do a vidoy and, and you're finished with it. You don't need to do more than that. Again, if if, if it's driven by, this person, I, I felt it was the right thing for them, because it's very clear to me, they were driven by being a deep pain over what happens, and they need the reassurance. They've done Teshuvah, trust in Hashem. The same Torah that said, don't eat the non-kosher food, also said that, that Teshuvah works, and that you can do Teshuvah. So, so, so you've done Teshuvah, move on from it. If you want then to grow in, in, in one's relationship, and that's a positive emotion, fine, then one can do more. So this, this is so essential, and important that we understand what the Rambam uh, says in his, in his Mishnah Torah, in his halachas, defining for us what Teshuvah is. Okay, so this is the first stage of uh, what I want to look at, just understanding the definition of, uh, of Teshuvah. Um, uh, before I move on to actually learning the 24 things that delay Teshuvah, any, any thoughts or questions around this? Does, this? does this make sense? Yeah, please don't come out of this saying that Ryan's Roman said that you, you, you don't need to love and hold from Kippur. It's not what I'm saying. I am saying, though, that over Yom Kippur, ask yourself, is this a positive day? A positive day doesn't mean it doesn't have moments of of of, of awareness of oh, I'm, I'm ashamed. It doesn't have moments of really turning. But but it, 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 is it a positive day in the sense that I'm I'm trusting in Hashem that I can change on Hashem. I'm asking Hashem. I am making change, and uh, I'm, I'm believing in 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 the the guarantee of uh, of of forgiveness from Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's not. It's a very, very good question. It's, it's, yeah. It's a very, very, very good question. Um, Rosh Hashanah is the first of us who made Shavuot. The Rambam says that the call of the shofar. I spoke about this other year. Maybe one year I'll revisit. Is wake up, sleepy heads, from your sleep. So Rosh Hashanah is certainly a day of Shavuot. The difference between Rosh Hashanah and the rest of the Sayyid's made Shuvah and Yom Kippur is that the Rosh Hashanah is, is the head. It's about the most basic things, which is about awareness of Hashem as king. And then it gets broken down into the details and, and, and the like. Rosh Hashanah is certainly a day of Teshuvah. The nature of the Shuvah is not on the Shuvah that's, that's expressed through Vidoy, but it's certainly about reassessing the relationship with Hashem and, and, and the like. So, so it is a day of Shiva, but you are correct. It's a certain day, a type of day of Shiva. And you're also correct that despite the title of my shirish, I think it was called Purish, or they called the Purish, um, I'm, I am speaking about Ridoy, and maybe I should have renamed my uh, shirish. But the truth is, my own working through Shiva, and so this is what I came up with, this is what I wanted to talk about, so tough luck. Um, but you're right, um, I'm focusing quite a lot on Ridoy, which is which is more uh, uh, the rest of the other nine days. But but what we're talking about in Shiva is relevant to, uh, it's the first of our made Shiva, it's absolutely a day of Shiva, but you're right, not a day of Ridoy, not a day of, of the, the unpicking of specific things, yeah, that is great. Okay, so that's the uh, the introduction of the Raman. Um, the things that will hinder to Shiva will be directly relevant to Shiva, so I, I will get back on, on track now. Okay. Let's turn to, oh, it's still on the first page, source three, in which the Raman says there are 24 um, uh, things which uh, hinder the Shiva. Um, I don't know if we'll manage to get through all of them or what detail we'll be able to look at them, but let's spend a little bit of time talking about this. Okay, let's learn together. Um, 
Esrim ve'arba dvarim, 24 things. Ma'akvin esot shuva. Ma'akvin um, can be translated as stop, but it's clear from the Ram later. It doesn't mean that they block the shuva completely. It means they hinder the shuva. They can make it harder to, to, to do shuva. It doesn't mean it makes it impossible to do shuva. So these, this is really critical halacha. It's something we all need to know. The 24 things that can delay uh, to shuva. Um... Arba mehem avon gadol. Four of them are delayed shuvah because they are such a big sin. And because of the enormity of the sin, God doesn't uh, grant the person uh, to shuvah. Okay, so if we have time and we go through all 24, we'll see they come in categories. So even though there's 24, they basically come in clumps or groups. So there's four that are this type, five that are that type, six that are that type, and so on. We'll see whether we have time to go through all of them. But we're now looking at one clump, which are, are big sins. And these big sins are, um, are, are so significant that Hashem doesn't uh, um, grant the person the uh, ability to repent. Now, there's two things that we need to think about in this Rambam so far. The first thing we need to think about is, what does he mean a big sin? It's really interesting. A big sin. Are there big sins and little sins? Are there big sins and little sins? What would you guess makes a big sin? Murder, for example, the three big ones, right? There's murder, idol worship, immorality, maybe the three that you have to give up your life for. That's a pretty good guess. What else maybe makes a big sin? Of course, we'll, we, we'll get to that in a minute, but but and we'll speak about that. But if you're looking at the Rambam, what else would one think was a big sin? How would you categorize big sins? What would we know? I said there's big sins. What would we normally say? Yeah. We, we will see that. I think normally, though, when we ask people, if I said what the biggest mitzvahs or biggest averes, I think people would often say the big three, right? People maybe would say Shabbos, Aseres Adibras. But you are absolutely right, the Raman doesn't say that big things. He talks about impacts. Very interesting that he chooses them as big sin. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what does he mean by big sin? Number one. And number two, we need to point out that when he says that Hashem will not grant a shuva, this is with our introduction that we need Hashem's help to do to shuva. And again, it's later, from the Raman, it's later clear that this doesn't mean that shuva is impossible. It simply means it's much harder. One doesn't get the same resistance. Okay. What are the ones that he says? Now, the first of what he says is very interesting because it does fit the category that you two have been saying. Um, we're now again in source three, we're looking at Aleph or A in English. Hamachti es harabim, when he causes the masses to sin. Or bechlal oven zeh, and including this, this is ma'akiv es harabim, malasis mitzvah. So it holds back many from performing a positive commandment. So either causing people to do a negative commandment or holding back many from doing something positive. Um, I'm sorry to be graphic about this, but what, what do we mean by that, right? So I don't want us just to picture, you know, a, a big figure from Nach, you know, a king who causes everyone to sin. It, it's relevant to all of us, right? Um, without being overly tough about this, if we're in a group and we we, we begin some gossip, then we, we'll be machter and we're causing a mass to sin, right? If we're in shul and we're schmoozing with lots of people in davening, people who came to daven, then we're stopping lots of people from doing a positive. So but there are in, uh, elements of this, even in, in, our, in our regular lives, even, you know, we're not big leaders who sway the whole of public opinion and society to sin. But the Roman saying that, that causing lots of people to sin is, is, is often God is a big sin. Um, number two, one who leads even a single figure away from the path of the good to the bad. For example, one who um, persuades to uh, to an Avera. So this, again, is quite scary. Number one was, even if you're not persuading, but it has a public impact. Number two is, if one is persuading. So so that's, again, where one sort of says to someone, come on, let's do this, or it doesn't really matter, or, or, or the like. Um, uh, uh, quite quite responsible, right? You, you're, it's having an effect on, uh, on lots of people, on a significant number of people, on, on one individual, but one's persuading them to sin. Um, that's also part of the problem. So again, uh, without being too graphic about it, I'm, I'm afraid that um, th these are these are relevant to us, right? Um, by example, if we if we if we let ourselves down and we we behave in a manner which others take as an example, there's traces of this element. Why are we reading this? Because when we're coming to do tshuva, the Rambam's giving us a bit of a recipe of where to start. The point of the Rambam isn't that, oh, these things make it tough to do tshuva, therefore give up. 
His point is, these are some of the reasons why we sometimes find it hard to do to Shabbat, and, and therefore, this is where we should start, because these are foundational. So certainly, if you're looking at what you're up to, um, try and think, are there any examples of where I'm having a bit of a knock-on effect? I'm, 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 uh, I don't know, you know, we, I, we, 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 I slap chat with someone, and uh, uh, there's a few of us there, and, and I'm allowing things to slip in, in the example I set, or the, or the standards we keep, and my family dynamic... Uh, you know, there's, every family has its stuff going on and bits of tension at home and so on. But I'm the one that's revving everyone up and then creating a bit of tension. Thinking about the sort of trickle effect of, of the impact one has, um, this is part of what it is. Um, number Gimel, which we're not going to go into in too much detail now, but basically he says a child who one has uh, responsibility for, but then he carries on and saying anyone else that one has responsibility for. So the primary example of where we have responsibility to um, educate is a, a, one's own child. But in the second paragraph, he said, in the continuation, he says, all parts of Gimel, part of C, is included in the sin. We'll have a look at it in English. Also, those who have the potential to rebuke others, whether individual or group, and refrain from doing so, leaving them to their failings. Now, um, I don't want to go too much into the midst of techocha, of rebuke at this point in time, other than to say the general advice um, in, 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 uh, uh, is that uh, certainly nowadays negative rebuke very rarely works, but positive rebuke in the sense of being a, a role model, being an example, giving encouragement to do something does. And I'm saying we have responsibility. Can you see, by the way, how there's a progression between these three? The first one is I'm persuading or influencing in a negative way, you know, an influencer now. We talk a lot about an influencer. We're all influencers. In a negative way, a significant number of people. The second one is even an individual. The third one is, well, I'm not influencing anyone to do anything bad. I'm just not being a positive influence on them. So I could have been a positive influence and I'm not. This also uh, uh, holds back uh, to Shabbat. And the fourth one is, I will sin and I will repent. Someone who says, I will sin, and Yom Kippur will atone for me. In other words, the, the, the danger of the fourth one is someone who's, who's taking for granted the gift of the ability to change. And as they assume that they'll be able to, uh, to change, and, um, it, 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 they, and, and they're reliant on that. Okay, what's the common denominator between all these four, especially the last one? Somebody says, I'll, I'll sin, but then I'll repent. And he calls all of these a big sin. And, and when I asked you what a big sin is, I thought you were all going to answer murder and killing and Shabbos and, and things like that. But you didn't. A couple of you said being a negative influence on lots of people. And that is the first example of the Rambam. But then he gives others. He says, even a negative influence on one person. Or even not being a positive influence on someone. Or even on yourself saying, I will, I will sin and then I'll do Teshuvah. What, what, so what makes this a big sin? What is the common denominator in all these things? Yeah. Like, I think that's right, but I, I, I but in a way, many sins are that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for something more than that. Yes. The person and then the other is just thinking about the mystery. Um, but I think that all like the common theme is that you could have been better, you had the you had the potential to either help people do it or or do a very well or a single person. Okay, you're adding very, very close. And anyone else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're getting almost almost there now, yeah. I'll just, I'll just put the hands up and give a chance to say something. Okay, I, I think the common denom denominator here is it's it's about free will, autonomy, potential, responsibility. Um, that's what's going on in this one. This is someone who isn't. All sins are in some ways not living up to potential. All sins are are being a bit flippant about your relationships. Hashem. The point over here is it's an abuse of of free will itself. It's an abuse of autonomy itself. The, the all four are the Rambam is radiating out from circles of responsibility. It's an amazing way. Think of rings, right? So there's the widest ring, me as an influencer on large numbers of people. Smaller ring, me as persuading one person. A yet smaller ring, me as not positively impacting on those who are very near and dear to me, who I could be a positive influence on. And then the final one is me abusing my own autonomy, not being a positive influence on myself, and saying, okay, I'll do this wrong, and then I'll, I'll sort it out later, I'll fix it up later. So what's poisonous in these four 
And it's amazing that the Raman calls these an other God with a big sin. Because, okay, when you read the first one, it does sound like it's a big sin because it's influencing lots of people. But by the time you finish the fourth one, it's just myself. So we ask the Raman what's a big sin. He gives an answer that I guarantee none of us would have dreamt of giving in a million years. What's his fourth example of a big sin? Someone says, I'll sin and then I'll repent. That's an oven goddle. Where, where on earth did you get that from? So I said, it's not one of the um, three other areas that you have to give up your life. It's not Shabbos, but that's a big sin because it's an abuse of that which is most precious in a person. The, the most, if we really drill deep and I say, what's the real you? Right? And, and, no, but go deeper. What's the real, real, real you? you know? So maybe someone will get from and say, my Nisham or something. But what's the real you? The real you is, the, is my ability to choose, to be autonomous, to make decisions. If you're corroding and corrupting autonomy, decision making, that, that's that's. Oh my God, that's the deepest thing. Okay, so I, I gave sort of practical examples of some of these aspects. Right? If you're speaking in Shul, you're stirring up Bosh Mara, you're creating tension at the table, or in front of the family, or serving a bad example. That they, They're all good practical examples. But what the Ramam is telling us is that one of the things that holds back um, to Shuva is, is a misuse of autonomy or, or disbelief in the power of decisions and the fact that we have. It is connected to what you said about being flippant about my relationship with Hashem. But I want to give it a better terminology. It's really being flippant about my relationship to myself. It's about being flippant about my, my choice making ability and, and the impact that it that it has. It's it's we all have a version of Echteva Oshav. I will sin and I'll do to shiver on it. Right? In a way, by the way, that's the famous example of, you know, I'm going to give up this bad habit, but I'll just have one more cigarette, you know, or, you know that, that sort of joke of one more. Well, if I really realise that, why am I having the last one? So it, it, it's about taking decisions seriously, realising that you make a real difference. If we lose belief in our, the real difference we make, or we lose responsibility for that real difference, then it's going to make the sugar very hard. Now we understand why the Raman lists this as the first category of things that make the sugar uh, um, th- that, that holds back to Shuvah, that make it difficult to Shuvah. And he says it's an Avon Godel because th- there's lots of sins we can do. Imagine how terrible it is if someone is Machal Shabbos. Shabbos is so beautiful in the big Shabbos. I don't know how awful it would be if someone walks into the Beis Amikdosh, the Holy of Holies, the Beis Amikdosh, and they, and they don't behave there with respect. But there's something worse than all of that. What's the most sacred place that can be? A human being's choice. Imagine you walk into that and you corrupt it. That, that, that's the real chiddle, right? That's the real tragedy. So that's what the Raman is saying. This is the oven kotel. This is the worst sacrilege possible is a sacrilege of yourself, of losing your, your uh, of the, uh, uh, um, uh, taking seriously the impact that you have. Now, again, I, I just want to give you real examples of it. It, it, it. There's nothing wrong with being a bit of a clown and having a sense of humor and having a bit of a laugh and so on. But, but if, if the clowning around is that you cease to take yourself seriously, meaning you don't realize that you actually make a difference, then that's where to start to shove if there's If you're an influencer and you don't take that seriously, you're the person that gets the chit-chat going, the national going, the talking Dublin going, the, the, the slight the not seriousness in the flat chair or, or the tension in the family. L- look, start with, where am I an influencer? Where am I making a difference? Because that's if you can fix that up, then you make the rest of your teshuva a little bit easier because you're reminding yourself that my decisions have consequences. They really make a difference. What will hold back teshuva if I'm not making decisions, if I'm not decision making seriously, I'm not making decisions seriously. I'm not engaging properly with decision making. I'm not taking bechira and free will seriously. Of course, that will hold back teshuva. Of course, that's an oven goddle. So when we talk about what holds back teshuva, this is why we need to learn these ramams of the 24 things, because when we talk about what holds back teshuva, he's telling us something real over here. The first step is, to take decisions uh, seriously, someone else or someone, else. And, yeah. That is true, but he says if you do it seriously, if, you, if you're conscious, if you're flippant about it, all, all our various have elements of all of this. Every other area does have an impact on other people. It's always an example. You think when, when it's when it's at the forefront, when it's a, a conscious thing, I, I'm aware that this is making a difference. But yeah, we, we there is an element of this. To begin thinking more carefully. You can even call this a little bit of mindfulness in a sense. It's part of mindfulness is it's it's it's, it's sort of a modern word in the sense of like, mindfulness is a lot of things and there's very peaceful insights and there will be work part of mindfulness is just being a bit more conscious about the decisions we're, we're making because if we're completely mindless then the sugar will never happen and 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 bullet point number one as it were the first four of these 24 that fall into this category are, are a certain type of mindlessness in which i'm not taking my my decision seriously okay we run out of time because uh, we're at 17 past um, I'd say for this year, I think this is already enough of a project, and you can read yourselves the other remaining ones. Maybe next year, or, or uh, um, if, if someone cancels in the next few slots, then I'll, I'll do some others of these uh, 24, because I'm, I'm conscious that we've run out of time for this time in, in going through the other things, which are Mark and Shiva. Um, I hope that uh, offers us some insight into uh, 
Um, even though Shoshana got served to you, that's very familiar. That's very familiar. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.